Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Kevin Dowling. Kevin is the CEO of Carta. Kevin, welcome to the pod. Thanks, Spencer. It's great to be here again. Excellent. Yeah, good to have you back. So uh, we did something that's unusual for this, which is we had a full dinner and an hour and a half long conversation before we hit record. A very good dinner, too. Yeah, it was delicious. <laughs> so. Plug for Summit, maybe, but yeah, the Summit. Uh, if you're ever in Mount Washington, delicious place to eat in Pittsburgh. Yeah, very good. The menu changes uh, pretty much every month or so. Uh, highly recommend. Right at the top of Mount Washington. Yep, great view. <laughs> delicious food. <laughs> no TVs. <laughs> yeah, awesome. it, it was really nice. Yeah. Good, good vibe. I'm glad you liked it. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, what I was gonna say is, I hope we didn't run out of stuff to talk about. I don't think we did. I can talk to you for hours. Yeah, if there's any particular subjects you want to cover, I'm more than happy to do that. Again, yeah, so going on. we talked a little bit about the test later that you worked on at NASA. I'd be interested in kind of getting back into that, maybe going a little further in depth than we did before. Sure. Well, back in the early 90s, NASA was very interested in automating some aspects of ground operations, launch, uh, out at the uh, launch pad, and, and so forth. And a uh, small group of us from Carnegie Mellon went to Kennedy Space Center and we looked at a variety of problems that they were facing that potentially could use automated solutions to do, uh, to solve those problems. And uh, we took a look at everything from uh, sort of payload maintenance to uh, inserting payloads into the shuttle bays at the time. This is obviously when the space shuttle was still running. And... Um, we, uh, we, in particular, we looked at a problem where they had to inject a toxic chemical into each and every one of the tiles under under the orbiter. Oh, interesting. So for those who may not remember, the tiles were basically pure silica, uh, almost like a foam. They're incredibly lightweight. And they um, have to be injected with this because the problem is they can absorb practically their entire volume in water. And in Florida, for those who've been there and lived there, know <laughs> that every afternoon there's a short, quick shower, and uh, yep. it's possible that the tiles could have absorbed much of that water and increased the weight and thus affected the subsequent flight. So the idea was to put a hydrophobic chemical into the tiles to prevent it from absorbing water. And uh, that chemical is dimethyl exesilane, ethoxysilane, which uh, shortened to DMES for obvious reasons. And uh, <laughs> people had to suit up in basically hazmat suits, full respiration, oxygen off in a tube. And they would go underneath each tile. And literally, it was an injection process. They find a particular hole. There's a little target. And in each of the 20 to 30 to 40,000 tiles that under were, were coating the underside of the shuttle. Wow had to be injected with this chemical. Sounds arduous. It is ar arduous. It's overhead work, uh, so it's not pleasant. Um, additionally, because you're in this suit, you're essentially in this uh, suit which provides all of your air and comfort, um, which was hard to work in. It yeah, was... limited range of motion, I would imagine. Exactly. And then lifting up above your head, combined with that range of motion issues, the weight of the suit and so forth, made it very challenging. So they would run shifts of people in order to get all of these tiles done and very carefully mark where all of this was. And they thought, they suggested that uh, perhaps there's an automation um, application to do this in a robotic fashion. And so we spent quite a bit of time working um, back at Carnegie Mellon on thinking up through ideas on how to do that. A manipulation solution was an obvious one. We even looked at doing manipulation off of the infrastructure in, oh, the, cool. in the orbiter processing facilities, uh, shortened to OPF. NASA, like the military, has <laughs> an acronym for everything. In fact, it's so bad that they have the ADD, which is the acronym Data Dictionary. Are you serious? Yeah. I'm, it's hilarious. It's not a joke. They showed, I, I got to, a chance to see this. I wanted to get a copy, but they wouldn't let me have it. Um, <laughs> Was it and secret, or they just didn't want to give one up, and it was all hard copies? I, I think, yeah, it was sort of one of like one of these nice covers, and uh, oh. especially bounded. So. <laughs> and I'm sure it's all online now, so uh, who who knows? Um, and you know, and you do have to learn this vocabulary. There's a bit of jargon involved in uh, working at a place like NASA. Um, but in the end, we uh, did propose and were awarded a contract to develop a robot, a mobile robot system with a manipulator to go in and um, underneath the shuttle in the, in the OPF, the Orbiter Processing Facility, and injecting this chemical into each and every tile. Cool. 
So it was actually a, quite a large project because not only did we have the manipulator portion and the mobile robot portion, the navigation portion, but all of the electronics had to go on the on the device too. And we also um, worked with folks at Rockwell. Rockwell had actually designed the shuttle, and so they were involved. Uh, I didn't know they were the GC on that. That's interesting. Yeah, they were uh, at that time. I think the Rockwell company has changed over time, so I don't even know today what exactly that, that group is. We had a group from SRI. We also had a group in, uh, in Florida at NASA, the Kennedy Space Center. And one of the gentlemen, uh, the gentleman who ran that project on the NASA side was Willis Crumpler, but one of his uh, protégés, Todd Graham, actually ran the project. So Todd and I communicated quite a bit over the next uh, couple of years to get this project in place and then to um, make it happen. That's awesome. So we, we made a lot of configuration decisions over the coming year. Um, it was a mobile robot, long base, probably almost two and a half to three meters long. Oh, wow, that's about a, about a meter wide, and it used, uh, I think many people have seen them by now, but uh, at that time it was still a rarity, the uh, omnidirectional wheels that have elliptically shaped rollers on them, uh, cool. sometimes called, called mechanum wheels. Oh, or, yeah, the 45 degree angle on yes, the parallel wheels. Right. Yeah. So by that time in the early to mid 90s, um, we, we knew about it too, because in the lab we had built a robot based on those, a small mobile robot, not a big one. But we contacted the Swedish company that had invented it, and uh, we ended up with wheels that were a half meter in diameter. Oh, cool. It could take the full load of whatever we decided to put on it. It's pretty massive. <laughs> yeah, it was, they were good-sized wheels. Um, but they operated uh, very nice. We uh, we designed drivetrains um, on the project were Hagen Schempf, uh, Bob O'Toole, Mike Blackwell, um, and several other folks who worked on various aspects of the of the mobile robot design. It's interesting. Hagen was my master's program director. So. Oh yes, that's right. He did yeah. the uh, he ran uh, the MSC program for uh, quite a while. Yeah. Uh, so we had a great deal of fun. It was a lot of challenging work um, and uh, uh, a lot of challenging technical pieces to this. All the all of the um, Electronics had to be housed in a container that was nitrogen purged because the chemical was also flammable and it was a, a, an issue. And um, so we worked with uh, folks to do that. And then uh, the manipulator was had to be customized for this. It wasn't you couldn't use a standard industrial manipulator. Makes sense. And safety was of paramount importance. The uh, the shuttle surprisingly is very thin aluminum on the uh, the out, outward structure of it, and then the tiles are glued to this outward structure. So it's not even an eighth of an inch thick, right? It's, wow, it's I didn't know quite, that. quite thin. So it would be quite easy to punch through it if something had happened. Yeah. In fact, when the orbiter is set up in the uh, the vehicle assembly building, that very huge building down at, at Kennedy Space Center, they have to be careful of foreign object debris, um, which could, in fact, punch through part of it or damage, at, at the very least, damage some of the tiles. The tiles are very friable, and you can just tap it with your knuckle and damage those tiles. Oh, brutal. So there are a lot of things to consider, and we uh, did a full-up integration program. We also enrolled the very first uh, two classes of the MSE students, Masters of Software Engineering, yeah. at that time run by a really great guy, uh, Jim Tomeko, who uh, started that program. I didn't know Hagen ran that. He, my program was the MRSD, the Masters in Robotic Systems Development. That's right. Yeah, that's right. The MSE was out of the Software Engineering Institute with uh, Jim Tomeko and other people running that. Yeah. It was a great lesson in software development and, and producing code that was uh, very solid. Um, and while it wasn't certainly wasn't bug free, we encountered far fewer than we had normally seen in the development of these kinds of systems. That's awesome. In academia, you don't have as much in the way of rigor around software development, uh, especially for the Robotics Institute and the kinds of things that we're trying to put together quickly. Um, but this program sort of forced us to uh, step back and, and improve that process uh, quite That's a bit. incredible. What was the level of automation on that? Automation, you mean in like terms how, of software Like was testing? it cooperated or was it fully autonomous? Oh, it was fully autonomous. That's cool. How did you localize that in the 90s? I mean, I, it's a challenge even that, now. That is a great question. This yeah. was, uh, if you remember, the very earliest days of SLAM. Oh, were, really? We're in the late 80s. I did not know that. Yeah. That's and awesome. um, the, that was worked on by uh, quite a few people, but um, uh, in the end, uh, that wasn't ready for prime time at that point. SLAM was still more of a curiosity in the laboratory and not being used uh, in, in the real world, so to speak. But um, what we did end up using was a barcoded system where that was attached to some of the infrastructure in the 
in the orbiter processing facility, processing facility. It was a scanning laser which oh, cool. read the barcode. That's awesome. And then it could triangulate because we knew what the barcodes were because they were surveyed into position. Nice. And in a controlled environment like the OPF, we didn't have to worry about um, accidental, uh, you know, sabotage or <laughs> or even uh, you know people removing these things or covering them up that kind of thing. So yeah. it was a pretty well controlled environment. Uh, that actually and the shuttle being parked incorrectly relative to the tags. Yeah, so you could establish that, but you know they did a great job at parking the shuttle when it came in because it was once once the orbiter was in the OPF, it was surrounded by structure. So to get it in, oh, cool. once it was in, there was an incredible amount of uh, material that was, you know, think of a gigantic door closing. Yeah. Um, and things would swing into place and lock it in place. Oh, that's cool. And it was done quite accurately. So there were like anchors on it that you would you would attach to, and that would kind of. I, I don't recall that they anchored it to the structure of the building, but they did park it in very well-defined spots, and that was to avoid any collisions with the, the surrounding beams and so forth within the facility. So it worked Makes quite sense. well. But even that wasn't sufficient to guarantee its position, especially if we were trying to hit this pinprick-sized hole in the tile. So we used vision to do that. Awesome. So knowing where the robot was by virtue of these barcodes could get us within a few centimeters. But then the arm would have to, then we, we would know where the center of each tile was. Yeah. Each tile was individually labeled, numbered, and had a shape to it and was very well defined. I remember spending a lot of time doing and thinking about path planning in that environment. And so because you have to hit every, every tile. Yeah. And so it, we did some fairly sophisticated time and motion studies, which basically helped dictate how large the robot had to be in order to do this process in a suitable amount of time to get it ready for the next launch. That's interesting. So, uh, and so the reason that you wound up with a meter by like two and a half. That's right. So, but the arm could actually reach beyond the boundaries of the robot itself oh, cool. too. So you could cover easily two meters by uh, over three meters, almost four meters. That's awesome. And maintain the rigidity necessary in order to do the vertical injection at that point. Nice. So there were, there were a lot of things that came into play in terms of uh, both simulating this and figuring out the path planning and what how many positions you needed because for you know you if you could cover 180 tiles or so from a single position that was pretty good because then you could you could so imagine if uh, we took the other extreme made a very small robot that would just you know sort of figure out where it is and then shoot straight up but now you're looking at 20,000 40,000 <laughs> positions that the robot has to be at. Brutal. And my thought was, well, how do you reduce the number of positions that you had to be at in order to do the injection? And that's where the balance and the sort of time and motion study. So you end up with a, a, a simple curve that basically defines the size of the robot versus the area and how many moves you had to make. Yeah. We recorded all this stuff. We were documenting as we went. We were writing up the ideas and thoughts and the investigations, the analyses we did. And that was very, very helpful in helping us to establish the uh, sort of ground rules around the, the robot and the system, but also helping us make decisions. And that was, uh, the, there were entire documents that came out of that. I remember we also ran, I led a mobile robotics class one semester early in the project to help sort of lay all these things out. So students got to work on something that could become real. That's cool. Which was, uh, which was fascinating. When we finally deployed it and delivered it, that's a whole story in itself, but... Uh, uh, I'm interested. <laughs> there were a lot of adventures, <laughs> just getting it from the FRC at Carnegie Mellon's campus down to uh, Kennedy Space Center in Florida to the robotics lab. Oh, wow. So we, we did some testing there. Like a Chuck Whitaker pack, I'm guessing? Uh, Chuck, <laughs> I don't think Chuck was involved in that one, but uh, because <laughs> if Chuck had been involved, we might have avoided some of the mistakes we made. <laughs> I've never seen anybody as masterful with a ratchet strap as, I mean, he knows that so much more than that, but he's probably, probably knows the trucker, his, trucker's, trucker's hitch too, right? He's amazing at getting things to not spill over in bands. I'm, I'm just trying, trying to think of a couple of things. things. So one is, um, you found that there was a grounding issue on the battery pack. So I had close to five to 600 pounds of batteries in the bottom of it, which from a center of gravity perspective was great. This thing was not going to budge if it didn't want to. Which is why you could go beyond the polygon. Exactly. Yeah. The frame was built quite stiff. We did a lot of analysis because we were told that that had to be structurally of great integrity and you couldn't move. And so we did deep analyses to show that. We welded up a very stiff steel frame 
uh, then epoxy coated. And um, I still remember to this day, uh, Willis Crumpler coming up from uh, Florida and we were out at a shop in Turtle Creek building this frame. And we had done some extensive load testing to show that the deflections were small enough that they wouldn't affect the overall end results. And I had, we had all the structural analysis. We went through everything, finite elements, just uh, very detailed. And then Willis came up, we took him out to see the frame. He looked at it and he said, you don't need to show me the analysis. <laughs> he said, this looks plenty stiff. That's awesome. <laughs> Which was great. But we had all the materials. We certainly had all the, the backup evaluations and analyses to show that. And the way we designed and built it was to make it as stiff as possible. It's probably not an approach we might take today because today with better software and control and perception, you can do things to accommodate structural compliance. Uh, whereas at that time we didn't have quite the same tools. Like or... controls engineering to compensate for a deflection. It's, exactly. Exactly. Right. Because once once you can see that you're off, you can then adjust the arm and then go in. At that I would time, think with the visual server when you described, you might be able to, but we could have. In fact, we, we did talk about doing that. In fact, there was some, there were some final adjustments in the wrist as opposed to the manipulator. We used a, Interesting. a very uh, stiff but uh, very flexible uh, three or four degree of freedom wrist to uh, be able to do that final injection. That That's really cool. Worked worked quite well. The, the sad note on all of this was that NASA ultimately decided not to deploy it. Brutal. Um, Sorry. Uh, we never fully learned all the reasoning, but they uh, felt more comfortable having people do it than they did have uh, than having the robot do it. So there was some skepticism uh, around the, the robot application, even when we showed we could do it, and even though we showed we had the full path, that we had the software analysis, that we had the structural analysis, we had the electrical analysis, because everything had to meet uh, class one div two yeah. um, on the electronic side. And uh, so we put a huge amount of work into it. Uh, I think that was one of the things that made me shift from the research and that side of it and, and to the PhD program immediately following. So, um, but you know, that, that turned out well too. So nice. <laughs> I enjoyed that. So it was, it was a great lesson. We learned, uh, uh, the whole group, the whole team, we learned so much. Yeah, how many people get to do that in school? I mean, that's incredible. Yeah, yeah you know, you build me a real robot. It was, yeah ultimately not deployed in the final application, but it got a lot of uh, attention and uh, we showed a, a, a path that worked. Yeah. Even though at the very, very beginning, we didn't know how, how that would end up. That's awesome. So, but tessellator, called tessellator because the tiles tessellated the underside of the shovel was, uh, at least from my perspective, and I think for many of the people on the team, well worth, uh, well, well worth it, especially in trying to make things for real applications. Yeah and not just for academic uh, curiosities or studies. Nice. One of the things I always liked about the Field Robotics Center is that it, it is that way. I mean, you know, a lot of times I feel like school is, is not really a place where you get to work on real things or, you know, it seems contrived, but in the FRC, there was always, you know, half a dozen projects like that going on that were always actually big, being big projects, big problems, big issues to solve. Yeah. But, um, but in no way should it be confused with just a, like a like a machine shop or or just a custom software house. It was much more than that. It was about building systems. It was about integrating technologies to solve big problems, whether it was in the energy side, uh, like Three Mile Island, and uh, subsequent programs through the DOE. Did you work on that as well? I wasn't directly involved in the DOE projects. Um, uh, ultimately, later in a job, I was, but not. Uh, uh, but, but not at Carnegie Mellon. But, that's fair. But, but within the FRC, it was very close knit. We all knew what we, each other was doing. I can remember walking, being in the high bay at midnight one night, trying to <laughs> figure out how I was going to assemble the final pieces of uh, one of the manipulators. And John Bears was walking through, and he said, uh, "What are you doing?" I said, oh, "I'm just trying to get this on. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll solve it. Don't worry." You know, he was clearly heading out. <laughs> put on his bag, took off his jacket, and said, "Let's get it done." That's awesome. <laughs> so we uh, we did it, and it was several hours later where we solved the problem together. That uh, I thought maybe that I could do, and I realized afterward I couldn't have done it without him at that time <laughs> and at that place. So it was just a great story. That's how the that's how the place worked. We had yeah, great people. Yeah, still does. Last time I was there. Yes, I mean, yes. I, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't mean that that was all in the past. No, no, it's all good. I, I didn't mean it that way either. Yeah. Uh, Chief, in your story, 
No, this, uh, but I walk through the high bay now, and oh my gosh, the number of projects there. there's a big water tank, and then there's multiple robots, there are drones, there are things hanging on the ceiling from decades ago. Oh, that George are... Cantor's agricultural stuff now. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and next to it is a fully equipped machine shop, which uh, yeah. we didn't have quite anything of that caliber in, in those days. We had a bridge board that I would use to quickly make stuff and prototype stuff at night. Now there's three last I checked. Oh, easily, yeah. yeah. And they're much more sophisticated, and there's a a very nice uh, CNC machine. Yeah, center. I think they have two now. So, I mean, <laughs> it's like 90s tech that, that Chuck's able to pillage from wherever he gets it. I mean, just for students yeah. to have access to that kind of uh, facility means that they can do everything if they choose to. You know, they don't have well, to. I've even seen local companies sneak in, and I won't say who because I have the tech <laughs> props will throw that. Yeah, I, I won't talk about that. <laughs> but I, I've, seen, I've seen people using those machine tools beyond CMU, and it, it's cool that that exists. Well, when you have a startup and you're scrappy and resourceful, you, you'll... Well, a lot of those startups give back to the university, too, though. I mean, Absolutely. In terms of I think talent people opportunities and truly appreciate what they had there and um, and I don't think I don't think as many know or understand how different this uh, that is that environment was from what other universities were doing so because of my travels and because of uh, projects that I had I got a chance to see all the other universities some of which we would compete with to get some of these pro some of the program money MIT or Stanford and elsewhere but they were very siloed uh, they didn't have sort of a large infrastructure around it many of them didn't have permanent staff which provides the continuity from project to project in the FRC. Yeah, Chuck's been a huge mentor to me around machining in particular, which is a big part of what I do now. Right, but it's also true of the software people and electrical engineers and people yeah. who handle specific disciplines within the lab. And to sort point. of pass that down and continue that. Um, and that's true in computer science as well, that they had a large staff which could build um, immense systems, like some of the early multiprocessing systems or the, uh, the chess playing machines and things like that. Many of the other schools did not. They had professors who had budgets, but nothing of the scale and scope that we had. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me. So um, we were, were and are still very fortunate to have that kind of capability. Yeah, well, I, I had a friend from CMU's PhD program go to Lincoln Labs for a little bit. He, he just, he remember talking, I mean, I drank the Kool-Aid because I went to CMU, but I remember him telling me, you know, how much better CMU's robotics program was than MIT. <laughs> Well, so very smart people at all these places and, and yeah. become good friends with some of them. And uh, yeah, we were very fortunate to have those resources. But um, there were even people, of course, from CME who went on to MIT and vice versa. So yeah, there's a lot sure. of cross fertilization of good ideas. I completely agree. And I don't mean to crap on MIT. I have yeah. lots of friends from there. No, it was, um, yeah. it, it, it's a good environment there with some great people. And uh, but just the, the scale and the scope of activities that CMU could to do like even the, the autonomous land vehicle yeah. program which later became the uh, the nav lab and subsequent versions of that, is that dolan's project or something different with the cadillac or is that no 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 this is this is going back years okay. the autonomous land vehicle was a government program to build a large vehicle this was sort of military focused at the time uh, darpa darpa grand challenge no no this is years before that so we're talking mid 80s okay the very first the one with the sonar circle tergerator i want to say no, uh, so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, so in the beginning, so Hans Moravec was working. He left Stanford, came to CMU. He was recruited by Raj Reddy, and he began right. developing uh, software and some hardware uh, in the form of robots to do autonomous navigation of such a scale that they were mostly indoors. Cool. But that quickly, within a couple of years, the work that was being done by folks like Larry Matthews and Alberto Elfez and and Tony Stentz and Chuck Thorpe, these are all students of Hans's um, who worked in his lab. They were developing uh, uh, software to do sensor fusion, to take multiple sensors such as, such as sonar, which you mentioned, and um, vision, uh, basically multi-eyed stereo. Cool, uh, but I wonder what else uses sensor fusion like that. A lot, a lot of projects today, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of them. It's more referring to CARTA. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, we do too, so yeah, yeah we have lidar and cameras and imus yeah. but mobile mobile vehicles do too because they're they have the same perception issue which is figuring out where they are and what's around them and uh with hans's early work uh, he focused on tracking features in the environment something we almost take for granted today because it can be done so quickly by even relatively low-cost computers uh, but at that time hans would drag a kl10 which was a big deck mainframe at the time to oh wow knees and running feature tracking. And so it would take minutes, like many minutes, to run 
that. But how did you get a mainframe on a robot, or did you tether it? We tethered it. Okay, that makes right. sense. So we had in, tethers for indoors and even a couple of outdoor runs. But then um, I did a grant uh, from it was a Ben Franklin program, which was the predecessor to IW here in Western Pennsylvania Innovation Works. Yep. And we got a program with a local company that was doing data transmission work. Oh, cool. Um, a gentleman named Bob Unitich was running that company. Uh, he had uh, previously been working with RCA. And this is down south of Pittsburgh and uh, hit with a company called Information Transmission Systems. It's awesome. And ITS. So we got this uh, Ben Franklin partnership program and uh, we developed uh, high speed radio modems. High speed is a relative term, <laughs> yeah. but we got sufficient speeds that we could do robot commands over a wireless link. And That's we awesome. used that on Terragator, we used that later on NavLab. But NavLab Ultimate, which was the first of the big roadworthy autonomous vehicles, had uh, enough computing in there to run everything internally. Oh, cool. Sort of high-end Sun workstations, real-time uh, Intel-based machines as well. Sometimes specialized processors like the Warp supercomputer built by H.G. Kung and John Webb and his group. And uh, these were used to accelerate and speed up and make the vehicles be able to run faster while still having good enough perception to stay on the road. When would you use a Sun system versus an IBM system and something like that? Like I what... think the Sun was very popular in academia because it ran Unix. And... But the fact that you had both of them in the same machine, I mean, like what kind of commands would you send to Sun? I see. So the, yeah. the Intel machines were primarily the vehicle, command, vehicle yeah. computers. So they, they would run the wheels, the throttle, the steering, brakes, and so forth. Okay. Whereas the Suns would be doing a lot of the heavy lifting on the perception side. That makes sense. Yeah. So they would take in images, for example, the frame grabber. Those would be analyzed. And even though the whole vehicle is moving centimeters per second, <laughs> it would be sufficient so that we could turn and hopefully not run up a tree, which one of the robots tried to do once. <laughs> well, the tree looked like a roadway because it was sort of triangular shaped because of the foreshortening of it. Yeah, I can see that. And, um, but uh, that was very early in the overall programs. But yes, there was a Terragator, terrestrial navigator. That was a six wheeled uh, uh, robot that could scale pr pretty impressive uh, slopes up to, uh, in fact, 100% grade, 45 oh, wow. degrees. Um, but also importantly was a platform in which you could put all these sensors on. So we were able to get a lot of testing done over years on Terragator, even in parallel with the nav lab to try new, new ideas out. It's awesome. Before they went to the big, big robots. But my understanding was that that was tethered, but I think I was wrong on that. Cause you said you had that radio mode. On. So, uh, Terragator was designed, um, one summer, I think it was summer of 84. And it was designed to be both, uh, connected to line power, meaning off the wall. And so it could drag a tether in that case. Um, and secondly, had an onboard Honda generator, which oh, cool. generates sufficient power to be able to run the whole thing. Uh, it's awesome. It outside. But it was all electric and uh, it didn't have any standard linkages and other things there. Each wheel was a solid axle and nice. all six were driven at the same time by motors and chains inside the base. That's awesome. So you had uh, dual motors then? And yes, it, it really only had uh, two degrees of freedom. Yeah. All three wheels on each side were each driven by one motor. Each That's cool. Side by one. There were um, harmonic drives in there that took the motors and geared them down. Which of the speeds you're talking about make a lot of sense. Exactly. It was never meant to be a high-speed machine. It barely could do a walking pace. <laughs> um, and if you did, you were sort of overrunning the motors. That makes <laughs> so, sense. <laughs> um, it never ran on batteries. Today, we might, uh, you know, I think we'd probably look at that. And then you had mentioned early on the sonar ring. So we, we, we deploy all kinds of sensors, uh, separate imagers, so uh, binocular stereo, uh, slider stereo. Um, if you find Terragator now, I believe it's down at NREC. Um, oh, no, it's in the library. It's in the library right now. I didn't know that. Okay, that's yeah, interesting. There's an exhibit going on there for a few more, a few more weeks, I think. And um, it's, th these were uh, built by a mobile robot company up in Massachusetts called Denning Mobile Robots. And they built a sonar ring to basically map out the environment. And Hans Moravec was heavily involved in that work in terms of interpreting the sonar signals, modeling sonar, and building out good maps. It very much looks a little, well, it very much looks like SLAM uh, did later. Um, but he developed a whole process using evidence grids, which he and his uh, students developed 
to be able to assign probabilities to voxels in the environment. Oh, cool. With the, so he's able to outline walls and so forth with a very coarse sensor. Because remember, if sonar, the sonars are pretty noisy and not the most. They're, they're not only noisy, but their beam is uh, conical primarily yep. and a very uh, wide beam, maybe 20 or 30 degrees. And so Hans was able to develop uh, means to assign probabilities to the single scalar value that the sensor returned. But as you were turning, as you move from one point to another, that distance would change, for example, from that wall to that monitor to the next object. And you could assign better and better probabilities as to whether that voxel was occupied or not. Well, that's cool. Because you have a different sensor looking at it now, and you know relatively how much you've turned. Exactly. So yeah. you could get, they, they were certainly weren't high resolution by today's standards, but you could get good data from a coarse sensor that was sufficient to navigate, at least to maintain some safety. That's really uh, cool. Environment. So and Jim Crowley was doing work. Jim Crowley was also one of the SLAM pioneers uh, who worked. He had a, rotate, a single sonar and a horn. It would rotate, built on the base oh, of, a, of a home robot kit that was uh, <laughs> sold by Heathkit. Oh, nice. Heathkit. That's a, that's a great throwback. People uh, often forget that there were, in the 80s, there were several companies building mobile robots for home use. Uh, they were not anywhere near as capable and... Uh, sort of intelligent, if that's the right term, as robots are today, just because of the software, the, the computing resources available to them. I mean, today, a, a phone would seem to be a supercomputer compared to what those systems have. They ran off little microprocessors. Yeah, it makes sense to me. So little Motorola or Intel processors. So like in the 90s or the early 2000s, I remember people running like multiple picks on one thing. Yeah. Get popular. Yeah, pick is great because it's a low-cost processor, but if you really want to do a lot of number crunching, you need a... A, you know, more powerful computer. Yeah, it's not the most capable thing. Right. But now today, with the advent of even the hardware pieces, FPGAs, companies are building their own ASICs, um, yep. also GPUs. Um, you know, you, NVIDIA has done an amazing job. Oh, with, they've been building some incredible stuff. Yeah. And it's going beyond graphics, right? They've realized yeah. the math is the same for the kinds of things robotics people want to do. So you can take advantage of that. What's the supply chain like on NVIDIA stuff right now? Because I remember they were pretty hard to get last I checked. Yeah, I don't, I don't have any uh, perspective on oh, that. No worries. Really. I, mean, I, I, I think they're fighting the same battles that everyone else is, and the biggest customers are getting the most attention. I, I purchased for a project a while ago some um, NVIDIA Xaviers, and I remember uh, scrapped the project. was able to sell them for more than I paid on eBay, which never happens with computer wow. hardware. <laughs> sort of a time-based arbitrage. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I wasn't planning that. I mean, it just got, got lucky. Well, if you didn't use them and you could make make some money off, I guess, of uh, selling yeah, them. just liquidating the project. Yeah, exactly. Well, especially if they were a uh, new old stock, right? You had If you hadn't used them. Yep. Well, even the used ones were going for more than, than paid. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I think I probably told you, like, I got a call from a buddy from NASA at one point looking for um, consumer devices that he could rip a, I think it was an SPI to I2C converter, but I might have that wrong. It was like two. Oh, that's funny. So they would protocols. actually desolder these from the board for a for them? a mission to the ISS. Yeah, which is oh my god, because that was that desperate. Yeah. Oh man. I think they ended up having to scrub the mission because they couldn't find them. So yikes! Yeah. <laughs> Even NASA couldn't get them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I heard stories about Atmel chips going for like one hundred and sixty dollars from a buddy that's in like the defense industry. Um, wow. I don't think it was. I probably shouldn't say yeah. who, but <laughs> if you need, if you guess, if you need those chips, you'll pay what you need to do. If it, if it slows down or stops a multi hundred million dollar program, of course yeah. you're going to pay 160 bucks. You probably yep. pay 1600 bucks a chip. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you would never talk to that person again once they became available. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it, right? Like my friend from NASA was livid at this company that sold them some of those chips, but they still bought them. Yeah, uh, yeah. But will he do business with them after no, this? No, there's so no I, way. Yeah. <laughs> Given the choice, he never would. People are poisoning the well, basically. Yeah, which is, exactly. Which is not, never a good strategy. You, you'll yeah. earn a lot more kudos by, uh, you know, maybe there's a small markup just because of demand, but uh, it's unconscionable, I think, to do so, you know, thousand percent or whatever the yeah. ratio was. I have mixed thoughts on that, because on the one hand, I feel like if the market's willing to bear that ridiculously high price, then it, is it really that ridiculous? Well, I mean, if you, like an eBay auction, for example, yeah. if you put it out there and then people bid it up to many hundreds of dollars, that's fine. They, they, that was their choice. Yeah. But it wasn't like you put it on there and then immediately said highest price. 
uh, yeah. here it is two hundred dollars for this little chip that previously cost a buck <laughs> <laughs> but if you do that somebody is willing to buy it is that not also their choice and i'm getting a little philosophical here but yeah but i think people take umbrage at, at having uh someone sort of like stick it to them and oh for sure they do yeah, yeah. i completely agree so, which is their choice <laughs> right exactly <laughs> Well, you know, it's interesting, the supply chain, it's affecting so many things. Uh, we've been fortunate right now that uh, we're using commercial off-the-shelf parts in uh, Carta's business and for our system building. And uh, we haven't hit really hard limits yet, but we're told by a couple of our the vendors that we buy from that uh, expect some delays. But fortunately, they're in the four to six to eight week range as opposed to... That's not so bad. It's not so bad. I certainly have talked to a number of supply chain folks who are experts and uh, uh, in command of uh, large budgets to um, supply for the systems that they're building in their respective co companies. They're seeing 52 to 62 week lead times now. Holy crap. And, um, you know, you just... It, it's hard to do business. <laughs> I think the worst we've hit at my current role is... A twenty week lead on something, which I mean, that's not that high. Yeah, that's uh, almost two quarters, though. That's it's know, prohibitive for us on a lot of projects. Yeah. But you know, if it's not critical path, sometimes you can justify it. So right, well, we'll work on these other things while that's cooking. Right. It's really interesting watching very large companies who scale demands a supply chain. It's really almost a just in time process. Yeah, but, but can uh, you even do that anymore? Because it feels like it's. Yeah, I, don't know. I feel like JIT's kind of gotten broken lately with, with the current market conditions. That could be. It may, it may be getting worse, not better for a while. Yeah. You know, in the containers, you know, I think we talked about this in our last conversation uh, around, you know, how much people are paying for containers. What used to be a $5,000 thing is $20,000, $25,000. Just for the shipping cost. Just for shipping. Just putting wow. them in a box, putting them on a boat, and then getting them across the ocean. It's crazy. And never, never mind even the uh, sort of blockade of uh, <laughs> ships out of, you know, Port of Los Angeles right now. But but companies like Tesla and Apple um, and uh, maybe one of the car companies has done a better job than many of the others. How did they do that? Like I, I heard a little bit of rumors of Apple stockpiling, but I don't want to get it wrong. Oh, that, that I don't know. Um, I don't know if they anticipated this. It would be remarkably prescient of them if they, if they did. Uh, and, and knowing that COVID, for example, would affect the supply chain of you know, many of the suppliers that they use. Um, I think their size uh, sort of dictates that they can get the people they need, the factories they need, and many of the parts that they need. But even even Apple is is certainly being affected by it. Um, and we buy iPads regularly, and we're having longer and longer lead times to get those right Brutal. now. Brutal. Yeah. Yeah. So, but fortunately, well, I know the iPhone 13 wasn't very different than the 12, so I imagine that had something <laughs> to do with it. Yeah, I don't. It's hard hard to say because um, there's so many. You know, I have a pet peeve with uh, with the phones because I, I really want them to have a USB C connector instead of this darn lightning connector. Oh yeah, that's annoying. <laughs> but that's not going to change right away. And um, is I, it just because nothing else uses it, so it's frustrating to have to have an extra cable? There's a lot of speculation on it. One of them is that because Apple owns Lightning, uh, they can charge people license fees to make it. So uh, yeah. are they making money on Lightning more than they would with a USB-C cable? But does that matter to some you know, factory in China that's making you know, it, generic Lightning connectors? Or do they even exist? Do they, they, they do, still... but I'm sure Apple in its very litigious way will go after them. So It makes sense. <laughs> um, uh, and stop them from coming in the country and being imported. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's... For me, you know, because I, I'm starting to travel again, I don't hate carrying multiple types of cables and multiple types of connectors. Yeah, I do that too. And uh, it's just it's just annoying to uh, have to deal with that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, as far as Apple's supply chain, you know, Tim Cook is a supply chain expert. He's been doing this since his entire career. That's awesome. And uh, I'm sure that a lot of planning goes into every product they build and every sub-assembly, full assembly. Even their own, you know, in, in a sense, their own supply chain, which is getting products out to customers, they, they do remarkably well. At, do you know how vertically integrated they are at all? Is that a part of it, do you think? That could be. Um, I, I don't think they're building all of, I don't think Apple is building the components that go into the phone, like cameras and chips and all of that. Some yeah. of them, obviously. I think like, they used to back in the day, but they kind of got away from that. Yeah. The M1 Silicon, for example, uh, is certainly stuff that they have made, but it's made by, you know, TSMC in Taiwan. And, yep. Um, 
So there are a lot of components in there that they certainly have a lot of control over uh, the glass and the frames and how things are made. Like even the laptops, which are the sort of unibody construction where they're milling out solid billets of aluminum. Yeah. Um, you know, in some sense, that's vertically integrated. I don't know that they're shopping it out, but it's very likely that um, uh, Foxconn or Flextronics or whoever or Flex, uh, whoever is building them for them today is... Uh, I think Brothers is a big support company for that with the Speedio uh, Vertical Machining Center. Uh, it could be. I, yeah. I'm not aware of that. But it's it's like a Fanuc Robo Drills, a 30 taper machine. I think they use them in, in that case a lot. Huh. Oh, I neat. believe it's a 1.3 or 1.6 second tool change because of the low inertia. Wow. The smaller tool. So they yeah, can do that fast. Pretty <laughs> neat. <laughs> well, I, I don't. I don't think Apple owns the factories that build their products. I think they work very, very closely with those companies, though. But it gives them the flexibility to shift production from one place to another. But the volumes they do, that's a hard thing. That's a t difficult decision to make, right? You have to have a lot of things ready before you can ship production from one line to another, even within the same company. Makes sense. So, but... Um, even like Taiwan Semiconductor, I mean, there's speculation, not to get too political, but I mean, there's obviously speculation of China and a not making Taiwan a country anymore and <laughs> well, I, up supply chain. And... <laughs> I'm out of my league here. I, I really don't Sorry. know how that's going <laughs> to... We don't have to talk about that. I'm just kind of yeah. curious. Well, a TSMC is uh, the world's largest foundry, so they're looking to sort of spread their wings a bit. I've heard talk of them building a fab here in the States. Oh, Intel's cool. building a gigantic one not far from here in Pittsburgh and in, in Ohio. That's awesome. Uh, Cincinnati, I believe. And they're going to spend easily $10 billion or more, maybe 20 Oh, wow. Um, this massive, massive investments. I worked in clean rooms for part of my career and building robots for those. And uh, it's awesome operating in class one clean rooms, uh, which is what these fabs now demand. Demand uh, yeah. is uh, impressive because you have materials that don't act gas. You have every time you have moving parts or lubricants, you have to be very, very careful about how that's managed and how that's. Uh, you have to test it. It makes sense. Uh, one of the first things I did with that company when I entered, they were talking about a new mechanism to uh, move the uh, pods that carry the wafers that at that time we were just shifting to the 12 inch wafer or 30 centimeter wafer um, and came up with some mechanisms. But everybody was arguing <laughs> when I came into the company, it was arguing about how dirty the mechanism was. And I said, well, where are the numbers? <laughs> oh, we don't have any, but we think it's going to be dirty. And I said, well, let's test it. So one one day I went over to, uh, they had a small area that was considered class one that they had sort of filtered off or walled off from the rest of the facility. And uh, so I went in with a bunch of sensors and tested it and uh, found that it was surprisingly clean. That's awesome. That it wasn't outgassing and it wasn't causing problems. So it sort of shut people up because everybody else was just doing a sort of armchair quarterbacking right it was yeah for sure like, oh this design will never work and uh it was big at joy when i was there like people really like to kind of crap on different design ideas yeah and if they have something to back it up great you know let's let's avoid going down that path but until you sort of prove it and maybe at the scale of the kinds of machines that joy does you can't do all of that but you can do a lot of thought and experiment around yeah. it you know with you know what, what is the issue dig dig deep analyze it do a prototype uh, take a, a regular machine that is already in use and modify it so you can run a test yeah i think yeah. there are a lot of ways to address that we definitely did all that stuff at joy <laughs> okay okay good well I, the modeling not as much but like the, the modifying existing machines or the making new like usually smaller machines for us Right. To test new uh, algorithms and sensor combinations was common. Okay, okay. Good, good. good. Yeah. But then I remember, like, I was trying to build a camera mount with a colleague once. We designed it in aluminum originally, and that got uh, vetoed by a more senior engineer because it wasn't steel, and they were concerned about cyclic loading. Like, oh, a, a fatigue issue? issue? Was yeah. it a moving part? No, it wasn't, but it was on a vibrating platform, so I guess that was their concern. I don't know if it was a legitimate concern or yeah, not. If you 6061 or 7075, you know, yeah. you can make it thick enough. And, and who's using a grade lower than 6061 in a robot these days? I mean, yeah. no, and it's, it's yeah. most of the alloys in the world are probably 6061 or, yeah. or the structural steels. Or the I've been learning a little bit more about aluminum lately because there's some work I'm doing. Um, if, if you're looking at soda cans, it's either a 3000 or a 5000 series. And then for building frame, I think it's the other one. 
So there's there's mm -hmm. some some that we don't work with in robotics that often that are kind of interesting to hear about. Yeah, I can't remember what four thousand series is used for, but like the two thousand, the seven thousand, and the six thousand, all very common in robotics. And even the car frames and truck frames are now being built up. They probably sixty sixty one. I would say. I don't know. I have a good friend who's been at Alco for many many years, um, and uh, he once told me that I don't recall the actual alloy, but there are a lot of considerations in those types of things where the flexing and the you know, the frames rack on a truck all the time, right? Or a car. And so you have to be very, very careful with that. I just bought a, if you ever want to nerd out completely, I just bought a 1,200 page book on aluminum surface coatings. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I think I'll stick with a couple of anodizing uh, <laughs> solutions I know about. That's awesome. Um, but, it, but it is good to know that. And we have, you know, here in Pittsburgh, we have one of the premier, if not the premier light metals research center in the world. The uh, Arconic Research yeah. Tech yes. Center. Yeah, out in uh, Alco Center, PA. Yeah. And uh, they do a lot of really interesting work. Um, they have a, a huge plant out in, um, I think it's Iowa, and uh, it's about a mile long uh, to, oh, wow. to build frames. They're doing all kinds of things. And the number of alloying elements you can add to aluminum to tweak various specifications is just incredible. It's probably near infinite. Oh, sure. Um, because you can vary percentages of many, many uh, alloying elements. And so you, you look at some of these alloys, they're as strong but lighter than steel. Some of them are literally run of the mill, but um, are ad more than adequate for many, many applications. So Yeah, well, I think the number, like the first digit, is defined by the alloying elements. And mm -hmm. I guess from there it goes by like yeah. the Yeah, I forget the formula or the... Uh, I can't remember. So I think it might be, I don't know if it's arbitrary, but I think they might have just... And this is speculation, I'm out of my element here, but it might be that they just named it like, okay, if it's got magnesium, it's this, if it's got, you know, yeah, so I, so I, it's that. I think it's the, the numerical uh, values and sort of the thousands place, hundreds place, hundreds place, does have some of that, but there's also the tempering side of it. Um, but then the percentages. Is you that what the T6 refers to? Yeah. Sixes? Okay. That's right. How it's quenched or, you know set up it's a, it ends up being stronger than without doing that and then sense. you have casting alloys you have you know, die casting sand casting and you can use a wide variety of aluminum for that you just well 1200 pages from now you'll you'll know all of this far more than i do <laughs> i've read about 20 or 30 pages of it if i'm being honest <laughs> it'll be uh, enough for me to realize i know nothing I think the cool thing about Pittsburgh is that we have this really remarkable set of companies and people who know materials well. It's one of the reasons Carnegie Mellon's materials uh, group is very strong is because of the legacy of steel, aluminum, glass, yeah. I mean, all of these things that were dug out of the ground or created from things dug out of the ground. Um, Absolutely. You know, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh doesn't have a big iron repository here, so why does steel become so big here? It's because of coal. <laughs> Interesting. Um, and then oil was first drilled for here, just north of Pittsburgh, up in Titusville. I didn't know any of this. Okay, this yeah. is well. so Gulf Gulf Oil, the first big yeah. one of the first big oil corporations. Um, later, Standard Oil, but the Gulf was based here in Pittsburgh, and the Gulf Research Center, which is now being. In essence, recycled. Uh, University of Pittsburgh has uh, housed some re research groups there, and uh, there's companies like uh, Teledyne Fleer and um, other companies that are over there as well. But that's a legacy of the, of that industrial era from, from Pittsburgh's past. Yeah, uh, that's really cool. Really fascinating. So, yeah, the, the the material side is still here. It's just not as prominent as as it once was. Yeah. No, for sure. I mean, I, I've recently been uh like i said looking into a lot of the stuff and just some of the people that recently got laid off narconic have been a great resource oh. um, or recently retired or still working there that yeah. i've known and talked to some really bright people with decades of yeah. experience who've just devoted their whole life to metallurgy you know or material yeah. science and yeah it's a whole and different even world. upstream from the metallurgy of people is like how do you make this into a product how do you make this and you know what what does that product look like and, yeah you know they're uh then you have so products meaning it might be beams, it might be tubes, it might be angles, you know, just all, all of these things. What does the raw material oh, look like? Yeah. But then even upstream from that, you know, should, does Alcoa, Alcoa got in the window business because aluminum windows were big, still are. Um, so there's a huge amount of uh, lessons learned from all of that. Yeah, yeah. From people I've talked to, that seems to be a big part. Like they would market it as an alternative to stainless for facades on fridges for a while. 
I heard the catchphrase, you have to be brandless to buy stainless, I guess would <laughs> go around the tech center a lot. I have not heard that one. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think stainless has gone away. but if No, it, it isn't. But yeah. when you think about it in that application, that kind yeah. of makes sense. Yeah. If you can get the surface to be what consumers want. It just want. look like it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's cheaper and lighter. Yeah, it's more malleable. Uh, it's easier to machine. Easier to form. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, that's yeah. funny. <laughs> But stainless has but stainless so many great has, uses. Yeah, exactly. There's yeah. plenty of things you wouldn't want to use aluminum for that stainless is great for. Yeah. Uh, and if you just need raw strength at a given weight, um, you know, the steels, steel alloys, 100 KSI or more um, yep. strain. And uh, I don't know. But it's, it's amazing that you're right here in Pittsburgh, we have all of that. And, uh, and there's more. I, I hope we don't lose a whole generation of people who are experts in this stuff. Yeah. We'll, we'll need them down the road. We need them yeah. today, actually. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I don't know if we are or not. I mean, I think there's been some recent things that have definitely diminished the pool or maybe diminishing the appeal. But I mean, the science hasn't gone anywhere, at least. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. That book still exists that I just bought. You know? That's right. <laughs> so it's somewhere you can find yeah. it on the web, maybe. Yeah. And then, um, now, I remember I was in an anodizing facility the other day, not to go too far down this rabbit hole, but I will anyway. And um, there was a 3D printed alloy they were trying to anodize. And somebody showed their phone camera uh, a picture to the director of quality there. It was one of the technicians. And it just looked like a mess. And I, you know, I was like, what the hell is going on with that? And um, the director of quality explained to me that they were trying to anodize something that the customer described them as being equivalent to 6061. Um, but it wasn't at all. It was a 3D right. printed alloy that was nothing like 6061 and there was like a high silica content and it was just you know not behaving like they expected it to because of you know all the subterfuge and well the, yeah. the person who sort of gave that spec may have simply noted oh it's the same tensile strength yeah or, yeah exactly or something and said, oh that's equivalent to 6061 where metallurgically it wasn't the same i think that's exactly it yeah. well we i 3d printed something for an ska project not too long ago where um I think the description of the uh, 3D printable uh, material was similar to urethane. Hmm. And it was nothing like urethane. Like we got it and it was, you know, the physical properties were totally different. And it didn't have the same wow. feel or, you know. That's an area. So bounce two, or any of that crap. Two areas I like to read about or do some down the rabbit hole, as it were, of the internet and looking at. One is um, uh, 3D. Uh, 3D printing, but for all, all only metal substances. And there's a couple of really interesting companies up in Boston doing a lot of work in this. I don't know how much is going on here. Um, secondly, your batteries. Just, oh, interesting. So in the mid-90s, I, I spent a summer in Sweden doing research on batteries and actually more generally power sources for small robots. Cool. And then I had, for some reason, I had to look up something recently and I went back to that old report and I thought, boy, is this out of date. <laughs> the battery specific energy and specific powers have grown immensely. Oh, absolutely. I mean, just lithium ion in general. Even in my life, the batteries I've put into robots have been totally different over the years. Oh, I mean, yeah. the chemistries have been developing so much. Yeah. You know, lithium polymer. Uh, that wasn't a thing until recently. Yeah. And now the solid state batteries. I haven't been, been tracking those yet. Uh, take a look at a company called Solid Power. Solid Power. They're doing some really, really interesting work. They're being funded, I think, by Ford and BMW. Interesting. And um, it looks totally legit. Like sometimes you look at a small company doing research in this area, and you know you don't see enough of the fundamental science to really appreciate it or understand it or maybe even believe it. Makes sense. <laughs> because they're making yeah. promises that just don't seem quite possible. But it happens all the time. Yeah, it does. It's across <laughs> numerous fields. Yep. But um, uh, Solid Power is one of a number of companies looking at solid state batteries, which instead of having a liquid electrolyte or gel, um, have solid materials. So oh, interesting. the safety hazards are much reduced with that. That's really cool. And they're doing tests like, which I'm pretty impressed by, but they're driving nails into the batteries. That's awesome. And making sure that they don't burst into flame. Or but it'll still burn. short out, obviously, if they're going across. It'll reduce cell. the output of the battery, but it won't necessarily bring it to zero. So the voltage will go down, like every time they puncture a layer, like you'll, yeah, I, uh, the nail test has become sort loss. of a standard. So I don't know specifically if they're directed at you know take the center of gravity of the thing and drive a nail through it. I don't know if that's that's interesting sort of a piece of it. But, Solid power. I'll have to remember that. Yeah, and they uh, they and others, there are quite a few people working in this area are doing some really interesting work in uh, making batteries that'll be lighter, uh, have more specific energy, specific power, and uh, give us greater range. So. 
you know, they're already hitting some some cars up to there today, hitting over 300 miles on a single charge. Oh, cool. But at 400 or 500, you know, that's, you know, I have a hybrid, as, as you know, it's yeah. a, a Toyota hybrid, and I can get 500, maybe even 600 miles on a, on a tank. That's awesome. But that's driving until the uh, the little light is flashing. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I know that, hey, if I just have one more gallon in there, I can go another 40 odd miles. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. Even more downhill. How many gallons does the tank hold? I mean, I could probably do the math. Uh, it's either nice. 17 or 18. Yeah, it's not bad. I've never brought it down to the to what the tank is specified for. <laughs> but I've thought about doing that, just carrying a couple of extra gallons in the back and the trunk and just seeing how far I can go. Would that be bad for the engine to run it dry? Like it could that? be, right? Yeah. There's, yeah. there's sort of residue and other things in the bottom of a tank. But my car is relatively new and I don't have that many miles on it. I have a little over 10,000 miles. Oh, nice. Yeah. Because I bought it just before COVID. That's and awesome. I wasn't driving much for the next year and a half. So. Yeah, that's pretty much as good as it's going to get. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I enjoy it, and I've had two hybrids now, but uh, I always keep track of battery technology, and my next car is absolutely going to be an electric car. Nice. I, I can't anticipate that I'll ever buy another internal combustion engine car. That's except, awesome. Except maybe if it's an antique or something fun like that. I mean, those are cool. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, I've thought about getting a Tesla at some point. I don't know. I might pull the trigger eventually. But, yeah. um, you know... All the robotics technologies, you know, Tesla is, however you feel about sort of the recklessness level of uh, the systems that they have in a Tesla these days, um, it's still a phenomenal piece of technology. It's by far the largest electric automobile, fully all electric automobile today in terms of numbers. It yeah, for sure. Nearly a million last year. That's incredible. One of my friends had a Porsche, uh, I think it was a Polestar, it was like their electric car. And that was really fun to be in. Like it was, it was an interesting, huh. interesting. This is one of the new Porsche Electrics. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, but it's interesting. Definitely to not as affordable as a Tesla. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting to look at the electric automobile, and if only because there are so many competing claims and so forth. But uh, a Tesla's done a really remarkable job at getting it out there, getting people excited about it, getting buyers to buy. And, you know, it's nothing to sneeze at anymore when you sell a million units of something. like. Yeah, car. for sure. I don't know if it ever was. I mean. Yeah. Oh, I just read uh, just a couple of days ago that um, in Europe, uh, which is a very popular place for gas and, uh, and diesel cars, that electric last year, all electric cars outsold diesels Seriously? in Europe. Yeah. Yeah, diesels are way more popular there than they are here. Yeah, so they, but they've decreased over the years. If you remember the Volkswagen emission scandal that drove oh, people away from it. Yeah, it kind of makes sense. They weren't quite as efficient as they <laughs> appeared. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. But so I think last year, if I remember the figures correctly, um, about 19% of all new cars were diesel and over 20% were electric. Oh, the cool. Rest, and the rest were gas. That's awesome. So, so just barely crossed over, but it's crossed over. Yeah, that's right. That's and it, awesome. But you know, it's all about watching the trajectory, not not a snapshot, right? It's all about yeah, that makes sense. The moving picture, but at this rate, um, and because the range is improving, the, the the car companies, however entrenched they have been, are getting getting the message and they're designing and building. I think I saw a bunch of Teslas when I was in France, like four months ago or so. I was in California last week, and yeah. every oh, every other car is a Tesla in California. Really, <laughs> It wasn't quite that, but it sure seemed like it. Do they are they still even allowed in the carpool lane? Like I remember that used to be a draw, and I feel like they wouldn't be able to do that anymore because it would just be like everyone would be there. Uh, I didn't notice. Uh, yeah. We I, I took a couple of Ubers while I was there, and they were able to use the HOV lane, but I didn't see any other criteria for being in the HOV. Lane. I think it used to be that like Priuses or hybrids could do it, and Teslas could do it. I don't know if it was both or, or one yeah, or the I, other. I don't know what they feel like they they brought that back, but I, I don't know for Maybe, sure. But yeah, the, the number of Teslas there could create their own traffic jam. That's for, <laughs> yeah, for that's sure. For sure. <laughs> yeah. I've, but, only, I've only ever driven two Teslas and both were in the Bay Area. <laughs> but the research in electric motors, too. I'm now seeing uh, pe there are numbers of companies building, uh, or at least purporting to build, car motors without rare earth materials. Interesting. And um, so electric motors, and I think the variety and size of them, they're going to become increasingly specialized for automotive work. So who who knows? You can imagine a, a lar much larger diameter. Um, that makes sense. Motor. Yeah, neodymium motors typically more compact. Right. So instead of having a small high speed motor, uh, because you want to do direct drive as much as possible and reduce losses and gear trains and so forth, but um, 
you know, is, is there an opportunity to completely I wonder why they did that. That makes sense. Yeah, there, there might be there might be ways of uh, doing that because the horsepower curve of a motor right peaks at a certain speed. But yep. they've been designed for about a century now to run on either line power, 24 volts or maybe 48. But are there ways to take advantage of that? So you get greater leverage from the torque developed in the outside of a rotor if you if it's wider. If it's I didn't know that. But 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 then that becomes a flywheel. So I know there, there's all sorts of interesting trade offs that may be a, a way to further improve the electric motor. That's itself. interesting. I've heard about some companies that are leaning into a transmission for electric cars. I don't know how common that is, but it seems to be. It seems to be it's a, a strategy backward. for some. Yeah, 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 it might be. Just I mean, if it's a simple best. planetary or something, just like a one stage gear pass, maybe. Because yeah. one one thing you could do instead of having the motor in line with an axle, if you could offset it and, and also develop a gear ratio at the same time, that may be of uh, of interest. Yeah. So um, well, that makes sense. Anyway, but what's interesting, I think, by watching the electric car industry, the battery industry, solar, all of these things are technologies that are also feeding robotics, and robotics will be feeding those industries as well. Yeah, for sure. So I just think the confluence of all of this, I think, is going to be very good. And people are, I don't know, they're thinking about technologies to really help, not to, you know, to, to really drive uh, these technologies into use the world will benefit, whether it's climate change or, or access to transportation. Or, yeah. Uh, well, just... from, what, from what I know of what I've seen in the history of robotics, I mean, automotive, even old school, has been one of the most automated industries of all time. It is because they make so much money and the faster they can make the cars, the more efficiently they make the cars, the more money they make. The GE Ultimate was originally for automotive, I think, which was like the first industrial robot. Was... Oh, the Unimate. The Unimate. Yes, okay. yeah. So they were, they, were... they called it the Ultimate. Yeah. yeah. So Unimate was a company yeah. started by Joseph Engelberger, very well known as the father of industrial robotics, yeah. and George Duvall, who came up with the original ideas. Um, but Engelberger started Unimation. Uh, it was actually near my hometown in, in Connecticut. Um, Danbury, I believe, and uh, those were assembly arms. But I, I worked on Unimate robots. Oh, that's cool. Uh, at Carnegie Mellon, we in the early days of the Robotics Institute, we have three or four of them: a Puma two hundred and fifty, Puma seven hundred, six hundred, and uh, they're very complex. They had more wires, more. If you look at the latest generation of small arms, they are. I, you know, without doing all the calculations around inflation and so forth, but they're very inexpensive today. For around 25000 you can get a very good robot arm that will... Maybe like the UR stuff or something different? Yeah. Okay, no, cool. you, UR is an excellent one, but even the Fanooks of the world and Kukas and so forth are making small high-speed robots that are very powerful for their size and can do quite a bit for uh, automation and uh, in factories. In a yeah, for sure. So and you and you look locally here. Uh, uh, Jurgen at RE Squared is doing a lot with mobile manipulation. Yeah, yeah and, Jurgen's uh, work is really cool. For... And and they're taking those arms out of the factory, well well out of the factory now. Yep. So <laughs> they're able to do mobile manipulation in the in the field. I think one of the projects they have is to install solar panels in a solar farm. Yeah, Matt and Jurgen have been talking about that one a lot. So, okay, cool. Yeah. Now I think there's a lot of. Um, need opportunities to bring even the factory robots, so-called, out, out into the real-world environment. Yeah, so. yeah, for sure. No, I agree. It's it's a wonderful time to be in this industry. Yeah. And I mean, I hate to say it, but Jurgen said this when he was on the podcast. He was saying that, you know, COVID kind of, you know, kicked it into gear a little bit because, I mean, you know, when people didn't want to go to work, it was a great sales case for automation. Yeah. I might be taking those words a little bit out of context, but... No, I think yeah. I think that's absolutely right, right? And and also the labor shortages, that's been a big driving thing. I've heard multiple companies talking about building robots to solve labor shortages, whether it's construction, again, an outside, unstructured, primary, somewhat structured environment, but at the same time, quite unstructured, especially in the early stages of construction. Even, yeah, for even, sure. Even our own company. Our job out. sites are a total mess. I mean, you've been up. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're, we're being used to do yeah. progressive scanning and construction environments to make sure that what's being built is what was designed. Oh, cool. To catch things so they can hopefully lower the overall costs of the project. Um, building as built models of the of, of industry but there's so many companies right now pursuing a lot of really interesting and useful hopefully effective ways of solving these big problems i saw recently some really interesting uh industrial piping systems that were built that way so 3d scan then cad then the system just delivered in parts so it's neat that card is enabling that sort of thing yeah we're um 
I, I think there's a lot more to do. There's a big gap. So what we primarily deliver are the point clouds. And then if you want to get into segmentation and classification and the uh, sort of awareness of what that surrounding is and then get to a BIM file or a CAD file, um, there's still a gap there. There's still a fair amount of manual effort. But that's, that's interesting. primarily a software effort at this point. So who's the end user for the point cloud typically with, with your experience? The end user, uh, the point clouds are actually good enough for doing general measurements of space oh, cool. um, and, and, and understanding it. You can do things like look through for voids in a building, for example, like what's behind this wall, what's behind that wall. Oh, neat. Um, so you just like, there's a space here that's unexplained. There must be something back there. Right. It's not, it's not immediately noticeable to people working in that space or using that space. But um, in some cases, we've been able to identify a, a void in a, in a building and people have to go, oh, what is that? We better look. <laughs> <laughs> but asset management, um, people using it. I would say one of the, the big areas that we're working on now is the idea of what I term thematic mapping, yeah. which is at its simplest sort of technical uh, sort of definition is time-aligned sensor data. And what that means is, we can go into a space and take a sensor. Maybe it's radiation. Maybe it's thermal. Maybe it's um, uh, subsurface. Oh, this is really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we can take all of those types of sensors and we can basically build a map while measuring this particular sensor value. And then we can overlay those sensor values on that map accurately. So both temporally and spatially yeah. within that same map. So for temporally, you would have to be able to do that more than once. You'd have to keep going through that space. If you wanted to see it changing over time. Yeah. yeah. So here's one simple example. Um, my son and I uh, sort of put, pulled together some uh, some code and capabilities in one of our current sensors where we're measuring Wi-Fi signals while we're mapping. Oh, cool. So in our house. So you can walk around the space. And at the end of this, and it's only a few minutes, it's not hours or days of processing, we can show you a map of that floor of that building and where the Wi-Fi signal is. Oh, that's awesome. And what it looks like. So it's a heat map, but a heat map of Wi-Fi signals. Does it correlate to where your access points actually are? It did. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. So it did. Um, you know, I was curious about that. Of course, the signal should be better near the, near the, uh, the mesh nodes that are in the network in our home. And, uh, but you can also identify some red areas. And so, of course, when you walk through a room, you're not walking it through it super densely. Walking, you know, we try to do a little bit of the uh, sort of back and forth, the raster scanning of each yeah. room, but we didn't do much of that. But because what we got was sufficient to understand and see the trend. Okay, it's green over here, it changes into yellow, becomes red. So we assign color values for the strength of the signal. And that gave us a wonderful way of looking at this data. The other area in which we've had great success is uh, subsurface munitions, where oh, interesting. people are, are trying to find and remediate unexploded ordnance that's been buried for decades. That's huge in a lot of war zones. Yeah, It, it is. Former war zones. It, yeah. Well, not only in war zones, but even in test ranges here in this country. Oh, I didn't even realize that. So in the U.S., there's about 12 million acres of buried ordnance. And uh, this is called UXO, unexploded ordnance, UX and O. Um, it's a big X problem being for exploded, of course. Yes, X, X for <laughs> explode. Um, but you know, you'd be surprised at even uh, state parks and wow. ranges. Not it's not just out in Nevada. Yeah. It's in the Outer Banks of North Carolina. It's in a state park in South Carolina. It's up in Boise, Idaho. It's everywhere. Oh, in Washington, in there's some of those out there. Washington too. State, up in Massachusetts, in New England, there are areas that are cordoned off to prevent people from going there because over time, some of these munitions come to the surface and people go, oh, cool. And people have been killed by picking up buried munitions yeah. and tapping on it or carrying it wrong. And most of most of these munitions are probably not live, but it's never worth uh, sort of digging taking it up. The risk. Taking the risk. You call the, you call the authorities, the police, the local um, law enforcement, and they'll, they'll find the right people to to get that and diffuse it or, or explode it just to it makes uh, sense. make sure. But we've been uh, selling units into um, Army Corps of Engineers. Many of the contractors who work in this business, they're actually changing their processes to accommodate what this can do for them. And it's typically increasing productivity by a factor of two or three. How is CARTA's technology able to locate unexploded ordnance, if I can ask? 
Uh, we don't, but okay. there are sensors out there like subsurface radar. Oh, cool. Um, or ground penetrating radars, sometimes called GPR. I uh, used that recently for something. Yep, magnetometers. Nice. Um, and so those sensors coupled with our device and they awesome. to do that. It's the same thing with the Wi Fi signal. We, we could have a phone or something else to, to measure the Wi Fi signal. And if you want to measure multiple uh, SSDs in an area, you can have multiple uh, receivers to receive those various signals. That's interesting, to... connected to each SSD. Well, not, not only that, but you could have multiple uh, receivers to give you a wider swath so that you get higher resolution maps oh, interesting. of that area. Do they have to be directional at all for that to work, or is it...? No, but most Wi-Fi antennas are built to receive as much signal as they can. I okay. mean, they are sometimes somewhat directional, as you find out from moving your laptop. You have to align them to different channels, or how does that work exactly? Uh, so we've primarily done experiments and work right now with single um, Wi-Fi receivers. And I think one of the one of the big areas that we want to focus on is also 5G, because they, the companies that are deploying the systems, the Verizons and others of the world, they want to maximize coverage while minimizing overlap. It makes so sense. It's a cost factor. So how do you do that without knowing? Well, they're trying to do simulation and modeling uh, uh, to, to do that in layout. And I think that can help to a great extent. But there's at some point you have to verify that or you find that customers will verify it for you. <laughs> yeah. That's a, and they'll call and say, I don't get signal here. Um, and because there's so many more points for the 5G antenna system that they uh, in the receiver system that they have to deploy tens of thousands of these, not, not hundreds of cell towers spread out, spread out over a region. That's, I didn't realize that. Is that just because it's a higher frequency? So the... It's much, much higher frequency. Um, and uh, it's um, because its frequency is so different, it doesn't go through a lot of materials. And so, so you have to have it um, uh, basically accommodate. So the mountain's really going to fuck you on that, for instance? Oh, yeah. I mean, even yeah. regular cell towers can't go through a mountain. <laughs> You know, these, these are relatively short wave um, phenomena, so you, you do need to be careful of how you position and place things. But even once you have those in place, can you tune them? Can you sort of change the uh, the distribution of that signal in that area to order, in order to better accommodate receptions? Are they electronically steered typically? I didn't, I didn't even realize that. I, as I understand it, you can you can go up and, and tune them almost like you can with a radio transmitter. Yeah. So you have a certain load going in a certain direction of the antenna. That's cool. But, but I don't know um, really if they uh, uh, if they can steer them actively. I, I, I somehow doubt that because they want to make, make these things low cost. Yeah, and, that makes a lot of sense. The, the beam For that to do, you need an array of antennae, and that right. would be a lot of money. That's right. But, but the wider side, side they see that that's that's uh, really, really interesting, interesting to me. But well, that's interesting. Yeah, so electron, electronically steered, almost like the uh, steerable radars. Yeah, I didn't realize that was a thing in LiDAR coming up. Yeah, people are working on things like that. Uh, How would you do that with light, if I can ask? I, you know, you can build the, the transmitter small enough to be able to uh, make them act like almost diffraction patterns. Oh, cool. Like, so. um, I haven't seen much in that way yet, but people are working certainly towards solid state LiDAR. Yeah. I saw some recently last week that um, looks like it's going to be a really neat and interesting. It doesn't completely fulfill all the needs that we have. We need 360 degree view, but you could take a few of these, maybe three of them, 120 degrees a piece. Oh, neat. Stitch them together and be able to get a full 360 degrees at much higher rates than you could with the current spinning mechanisms. That's awesome. I'm sure you can't talk. I'm curious who's developing that, but you know, I, I would. You, you can actually look online. You'll see several companies are okay, all working cool. on that. Because, because I remember that was a holy grail even four years ago or five years ago. I mean, people were trying really hard to solve that. Yeah. Well, there's, there's little bits and pieces of it that they are solving right now. No one's sort of pulled it all together in a single economical solution yet, but they're getting there. And the price of lighter continues to drop because they're, they're very, very competitive. That makes sense. That's Something we paid $30,000 for six, seven, seven, eight years ago, went down to 15000 went nice. down to ten. And we're seeing units down as low as 3,000. Um, wow. Uh, in relatively small volumes. So once you get into the high volumes, you're... That'd be like the ouster? So companies like ouster, Quantergy, um, Melodyne, of course, and um, uh, many others are working very hard to make lower cost systems, but at the same time, higher performing. That makes sense. So it's not quite at the rate of Moore's Law. It's not doubling performance. It's not having the cost every year, but it is... Um, Moving in, and it's definitely moving in the right direction. That's awesome.
So, well, I mean, I think when solid state becomes viable, I mean, that's going to be a breakthrough for sure. Right? Yeah. Well, well take, take a look at also at the new iPads and the newer iPhones, which have LiDAR built into them. So they're really I heard really that. My dad was saying that. And in my head, I was like, is that true LiDAR, I wonder? It is. Okay, uh, that's cool. But it's very coarse and it's limited range. Um, Apple is using them primarily for, or at least said they were uh, using them primarily for augmented reality applications. But I think that and computational photography, the ability to now have a sense of scale in the environment, typically yeah. the images are sort of independent of scale. You don't know if you're looking at a dollhouse or a full house kind of thing. Um, but the LiDAR can give you measurements into that. They can help you with focusing, depth of field, and many other computations. But also, you can build maps with them. And so there are a number of apps now on the iPhone and the, and the iPads that allow you to build maps of environments. I've been testing them out. I um, met, awesome. met up with one of the companies doing the software for that, and uh, we've been talking about how, for, how, how to further improve these maps and capabilities. Sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, it is. It is. So we'll see, we'll see what happens over the coming, over the coming years. Right now, my, my focus has been on this thematic mapping application. Not just the sort of mapping of buildings, but doing something interesting with it and gathering additional data around it. Yeah, that. that's interesting to me. So just adding in like another sensor that's not directly mapping, but correlating some other factor. Exactly. Yeah. And, and we, we have plenty of examples of that, like radiation, yeah. uh, working on the varied ordinance, as I mentioned, uh, RS signals, um, and others. So uh, yeah. and another one we're working on with... Um, in a government contract is uh, toxic chemicals. Um, Makes sense. To identify them with a specialized sensor and capability that, that can be mapped into the overall. You could probably even do gas area. deposits and mines. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's. If there are sensors for the specific things that you're looking for, yeah, yeah. absolutely. You could do, well, and, and you can think about a gas leak, for example, where you want to, you're walking around, you're sensing, and you're also building out a map that may tell you where you should move to, as yeah. opposed to just like, you know, like the old game with uh, kids, you know, warm, hot, warm, hot, warm, yeah. warm, warm, warmer. I reckon and, it's this way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you're sort of limited in that yeah, because now you can build out of... The canary battery. died, we shouldn't go there. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that would be <laughs> one to stay out of. Um, but you can now build a higher resolution map of those types of areas that gives you a much better picture of the plume, where that material is going, and then where it was sourced from. Oh, cool. So we'll see. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's exciting, exciting stuff to watch. Seems Very like cool. we're at a good natural stopping point. Yeah. Uh, is there anything you want to plug while you're here? <laughs> Take a look at Carter's website. I think you'll find some exciting things there. It may not look like a robot, but all the components of robots are in. All right, check out Carter's website. Uh, subscribe to the podcast if you haven't yet. Thanks for coming around. Thank you, Spencer. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. If you stuck around this long and you like what you've heard, please give us a like and smash that subscribe button or smash that like button and give us a subscribe. We're always looking for new and interesting people to have on the show. If you know anyone good, send an email to podcast at ska.solutions or leave a comment below. Thanks again for listening and please come to the next one.